So perspective values are, <clears throat> are a formal theory, which um, I'm developing with some colleagues. And uh, we published a, a paper, big paper this year in um, LAMP, which is Logic and Mathematics of Programming. And uh, with contributions from Mexico, Scotland, England, uh, Portugal, which sounds like an impressive international collaboration, but there's a different explanation. In 1922, when the motor car was becoming popular, uh, the, the Motor Club was founded in Middlesbrough. And uh, over the course of the years, this, this building uh, fell into the hands of the Polytechnic and was given to the staff, at really given, it, they, we had the deeds, we owned the building. And um, the, so the old motor club became our staff club. And the, the people who contributed to this used to sit round a round table in the old motor club and talk about it. And uh, at a certain point, the university said, you don't need your own staff club. We want to build a building there, but we'll always give you a place to meet for, for, for your staff discussions. And so we had a, a place in the university. And then one summer they said, oh, we've got to re, 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 refurbish it. And it disappeared. We, we never got it back. Uh, this is symptomatic of, of uh, the attitude of management. And the people who used to sit around the table fled in all directions because it wasn't the only thing that was being done to them. It was a complete disrespect of thought and ideas in favour of managerial manipulation. So that's why we have contributors in Mexico, Portugal and Scotland, because none of them wanted to stay where they were. And I retired. But uh, we're all still friends. So in this perspective values, the key is this idea S diamond E. S is a program. E is an expression. E is a mathematical expression. And it means what E would, what value E would have if you execute, were you to execute S. So I'm trying it out on here on four. So here's a simple example. X one plus two X diamond ten X. What would the value of ten X be if you were to execute X one plus two X? And it would be ten times the current value of X plus one. So in, in here, I've got, on the left-hand side of the diamond is fourth. So I've used a different typeface. That's the real world, if you like. That's the Earth and the Moon. And on the right side is, is mathematics, which is just uh, equations to talk about the real world. So th this is a bit arbitrary, because um, fourth has got every right to be considered a formal notation as much as mathematics has. It's just my decision to think of the fourth as kind of representing the real world and the, the mathematics that's describing it uh, on, on the right as being something more abstract. So I've got an, a, a large equals. That's a very low priority symbol, which kind of splits the thing in two. And a diamond, which is another low priority symbol, which splits the fourth from the mathematics. We, we did some work on we, 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 um, this, this uh, perspective values is used for describing programs that can do sequential programs, but with a, with a backtracking ability. And uh, we have a, a fourth uh, virtual machine to uh, provide an implementation platform. Um, so perspective values for fourth. Um, fourth is so different from an ordinary computer language that you're more or less forced to, this is why I was forced to consider fourth as part of the real world. Um, the, the, the toy languages we play with when we do formal semantics, um, they're really sort of so similar to mathematics. Ex their expression language is proper mathematical expressions, whereas in fourth, everything's in, in postfix or there are stack manipulations. So the stack is important for us now. Um, so how do we represent the stack as, in, in our mathematical world? 
So it, it has to be a, a form of tuple. It, 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 it stack can hold any, any type of object. Um, so so uh, after you do an SP store, the, the little s is, is the stack in our mathematical world. Uh, and an empty, we, we need a symbol for an empty stack. So this, is, this doesn't correspond to anything that's on the stack or in the stack. It's just mathematically an empty stack's going to be epsilon. And um, this, uh, we, we, the stack is, this, the stack is made of maplets. So after you put one on the stack, you've got epsilon maps to one. Put a two on the stack after that, you've got epsilon maps to one, maps to two, and so on. And uh, if you do a plus, the last example there, epsilon maps to one, maps to 12, because you've got two and 10 on the top of the stack, and they become a 12 when you do a plus. Uh, but you can simplify your notation, because we, if, if the stack is non-empty, you don't need to bother to put the epsilon on. And you can replace the, the maplet symbol with a, with a space. So this is how we would write the, the stack after these operations. So in the last one, if you do SP store, then you do 1, 2, 10 plus. The stack afterwards will be 1, 12, the, the items on the stack. There's two levels of granularity in this uh, talk. Um, in ordinary computer languages, you typically have an assignment where you say, assign some expression to x. And it's done in one go. Whereas in fourth, you can break that expression into all the steps, because in postfix, every step has its own semantics. So there's a coarse grain semantics where you just assign the whole expression, and a finer grain semantics where you're looking at what happens to the stack for each of the fourth operations that make up the postfix expression. We've got um, a need to translate bits of fourth into bits of mathematics, and this E with funny brackets around it. Um, the, the, these brackets, often called semantic brackets, you use them when, you, when you're dealing with two different languages at the same time. So inside these semantic brackets are fragments of fourth, and what you get out of it is a mathematical expression. So it's a translation from fourth to mathematics, like x1 plus would translate to x plus 1. So we translate individual variables, and we also use typeface to, to make it clearer. So the mathematics is in italic typeface, and fourth is in um, Roman typeface. And it's, it's case sensitive. So for us, a capital X is completely different from a small X, just completely different. So the semantic brackets, you have X 10 plus translate to x plus 10. But you can do translations that have got stack operations in. So x dupe dupe times plus translates to x squared plus x. And you can work those out with a, with a stack trace. Here's a rather extreme stack trace, which shows you can do quite a lot with a stack. Um, this is a, a sort of fourth mind teaser. You have, to, you have to start with A, B, and C on the stack, and you have to end up with 2 times A, B plus 2 times A, C plus 2 times B, C. So it can be done just. So... These semantic brackets are a bit clumsy to use, so sometimes we just use a change of typeface. So we change capital E, which represents a fourth expression, to mathematical italic E, which represents the equivalent expression in, in, in the mathematical world. And the, the semantics, the risk, this, this is incomprehensible if you, haven't, if, if you haven't spent six months thinking about it, so I apologize for that. Um, the, 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 the semantics of, of um, assignment at this level is represented by lambda expressions. Uh, very, very famous in computer science, lambda calculus and all that. 
it's just an expression for substitution. Um, so with this one here, lambda x two times x applied to y plus 10, you just write this expression two times x, but wherever you have an x, you put in y plus 10 instead. It's a substitution notation. So that comes to two times y plus 10. And the semantics of assigning e to x, and then what would be the value of the mathematical expression afterwards, is given by lambda x dot f e. So understanding mathematics is a very strange thing. I, I think maybe you have to actually grow some brain cells to show you this. It's a very short. All I can really say now is, isn't it a short equation? It doesn't go on for more than one line. It doesn't go on for half a line. But we can follow it perhaps through an example. So uh, we're assigning x plus 10 to x. And we want to know the, the value of 2x plus y after we've done it what it would be were we to do it, I should say. And uh, so we have to apply this lambda expression to x10 plus, which translates to x plus 10. And uh, the value you get is 2x plus 10 plus y. So the stack, um, OK, we've done some tra traces. That was rather informal. Um, to, to treat it mathematically, we have to be able to split it up and take off the top of the stack from the rest of it. And we have these um, operations L and R. So the rightmost element of the stack is the top item. L of the stack is the rest of it. So for instance, the top of the stack is RS. And the next one down is R of LS. LS is the left, the left side of the stack, the rest of it, not the top. And the top item of that is RLS, that's next. So top and next, commonly used in, 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 in fourth discussions. So that previous uh, semantics of assignment uh, looks quite magical, but in fact, it only, only, only works when you're assigning the whole of a value. So if you're assigning to a, an element of array or something like that, you have to um, work out what the whole of the new array would be and then assign that. And it's the same with the stack. We can't use that old assignment. Um, and we, we have some helper functions. So these drop s uh, is going to be what the stack would be if you drop the top item. And that's going to be defined as ls. Two drop is L squared S, because you do an L and an L. NIP is LS maps to RS. Swap plus minus defined like this. And then to describe the value of some expression E after the stop stack after a stack operation op, uh, we have this little equation here. Again, I think this is completely incomprehensible, but it's short. But maybe you can follow it through in an example, which we'll come to in a moment. So sequential composition. In fourth, you just have two words, S and T. The composition is S, T. Very, very simple. It's wonderful. But S, T diamond E is... The rule for it is S diamond T diamond E. It's a very strange rule. Diamond's right associative, so S diamond T diamond E is S diamond T diamond E in brackets. Now, S and T are programs. T diamond E is not a program, it's an expression. But it, it describes the rest of the computation, even though it's only an expression. And to do this, we have to use a very unorthodox mathematics, not invented by us, invented by a friend of ours in Canada, Rick Hayner, who I also mentioned when I was talking about the halting problem. Last time I managed to get to a, last time we had a Euro 4. Um, and 
when we try to publish this, we get two reactions. This last paper, the, the referees were incredibly enthusiastic. But we have another sort of referee who said, who are you to go reinventing mathematics? You know, you live in bloody Middlesbrough. So you can never tell what will happen when you, when you submit a paper. Now here's something exciting. <laughs> we, we can use our rule to show that the effect of NIP is equivalent to swap drop. And here's why it's so strange. Swap drop diamond S, you would think you want to work out what swap does first. But this semantics works out what drop does first. How can that be? Well, it's a kind of Q-jumping semantics, because although you've worked out drop diamond S, then you can go, come in for swap, and swap will kind of Q-jump and do its bit sort of before uh, the drop, which, which we can see... When we go from this line here to this line here, suddenly you, you've got swap applied to drop S, which is drop S is what describes the stack, stack after a drop. But here, swap has jumped the Q and it's being applied to S before. So you, you applied lambda S dot drop S to swap S. And... Uh, By the grace of God, this works. So now we come to the very strange mathematics. Um, we have, um, this is a backtracking semantics, and backtracking can be triggered by what we call a guard. So you have a flag, G, on the stack, uh, and then this little arrow. What this does is, if G is true, Nothing happens, it just carries on. If G is false, you run backwards. We have, um, I've been interested in this since the, uh, the last meeting of Fig UK. Fig UK was an interesting organization because it was founded in 1979. It ran fairly smoothly until our Gil Philby, our, one of our principal movers, died. He always used to organize our meetings at his university in the South Bank. And... Uh, the, the, the last meeting was the 21st anniversary meeting where, we did, where everyone got into a discussion on reversible fourth. And, oh, you could have a third stack, a history stack. You could use that, you know, roll back and do stepwise reversal. And uh, I went away and implemented it, and I've been interested in it ever since. Because what I discovered, you've got an crazy num incredible number of mathematical simplifications by regarding computations as reversible. It's, it's, it, it's simpler. Like in, in, in physics, if, you, if you're thinking about the, the, um, the physics of a billiard table, much easier to think that uh, the billiard table is perfect, and if one billiard ball hits another, you keep all your energy, energy conserved. You, know, you can predict what's going to happen for the future. And also, if you, saw, if you did an animation of a billiard table with... Um, this perfectly elastic uh, physics, you wouldn't be able to tell whether the simulation was running forward in time or backward in time. Forward in time, you lose energy in a real billiard table. Things come to an end. You can easily say which way time is running. If you do the mathematical simplification, go back to A-level mechanics where you don't need to worry about friction and things, uh, you, you, your, 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 your billiard table um, runs forever the mathematical model is much simpler. And the mathematical model of semantics for a reversible computation is simpler than for a forward computation. I, I, that, that's a, I, I can't justify that, but that, that's a kind of faith that keeps me going. So uh, we, we, we have this reformulation of mathematics, which gets us into a lot of trouble. So where it's based is if you... Uh, know what a set is, you'll be able to sort of follow it. So, um, this, this, this um, we use twiddle to represent the unpacking of a set. Now, when you have a set, like the set containing one and two, you have two different things. You've got a collection, you've collected one and two, and then you've put them inside 
the brackets. So collection and packaging. And what Eric Hayner said is, well, why, why, why don't we say there are two different things? You collect and you package. You don't, have to, don't necessarily have to package. You can collect without packaging. Or if you've got a package, you can unpack it. And so unpacking 1, 2 gives you 1, 2 without the set brackets. This is an unpackaged collection. And very useful to represent something that might be 1 and might be 2. You don't know. And then very weird, if you unpackage the empty set, what you get we call null. It represents nothing at all. So this 1, 2, that comma now is a mathematical operator. It's, it, it's, a, it's a combining two different collections, each containing an element. Um, and so this comma has got nice simple rules. S, comma T is the same as T, comma S. S, comma Null is the same as S. Uh, additional property of null is that if you package it, you get the empty set. So we have a, a programming guard that starts reversible computation. And in our mathematics, we have a bunch guard. And its rules are like this. True guard Z is E. False guard Z is null. And this, we begin to see that we have mathematical expressions that can resemble programs. And they're very strange. Like x equals 1 guards x has the value 1 if x equals 1. And otherwise, it's nothing. So I, 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 there's a few people in the world who use this. I think it's absolutely brilliant. It comes from Eric Hayner. There was a guy, an Irish guy, in Dublin City University made a lot of use of it. There's a, a guy who wrote a book about compilers using it. It's hard, but there's hardly any, there's a handful of us that use it. So I wanted to ask chat the GTP when I got hold of it. I asked it this question. Has the concept of nothing been formulated mathematically? And I had to wait quite a long time for a response, and then it came up with this. So our semantic rule for guard is, G guards diamond E. Well, if G is true, nothing's going to happen. It's just going to be E. Uh, but if G is false, it's going to be nothing. Nothing will mean you're, you're backtracking. You're in, there isn't anything afterwards because you didn't get afterwards. You went backwards instead. So guards... Uh, we have um, a choice structure as well. Um, so S1 choice S2, it's either going to do S1 or S2, but this semantics doesn't tell you which. You could implement it in different ways. You might implement it randomly, which has the advantage that you could set off several versions of a program, and they would all make different choices. And if they were searching, you would get a speed advantage just by m making it a random choice. But sometimes it's... it's uh, it's a choice where the first thing is chosen first. But that's another implementation. But the, the, the semantics of this doesn't, doesn't tell you which it is. So the semantic rule for choice is S choice T. Oh, well, it, well, wait a minute. We need brackets. So, uh, so that we don't just do it one thing at a time, blow by blow, as we usually do in fourth, you have to put it in some kind of bracket, as you do with an if statement. Uh, and so we, 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 we have these choice brackets. But this, the semantic rule is just S choice T diamond E is S diamond E comma T diamond E. So this comma is the, is the bunch union that I just discussed before. So if you choose 1 to X or 2 to X, and then what would the value of X be were you to do this? It would be 1 comma 2 would be either. You don't know. But this combination of guards and choice allows us to express backtracking. So think of backtracking. With an if statement, you do the test before. You make a decision before. With backtracking, you make the decision, effectively make the decision afterwards. You make choices, but which one, get, which one remains, you decide afterwards when you see what the results are. So here we've got a choice of 1 to x or 2 to x. 
and then the guard is x2 equals. So it's only going to be satisfied if you choose the two. If you choose the one, it's going to force you back. But the semantics isn't going to go into the details, the operational details. It's going to faithfully re represent the operational details, but it's going to just do a mathematical um, analysis. So by sequential composition, uh, the e uh, we have um, this choice is choice one to x two to x diamond x two equal guards diamond x. So this x two equals guards um, gets changed into from programming guards to bunch guards and so it's x equals 2 guards x and then by the semantics of assignment uh, by semantics of choice it's either the effect of assigning 1 to x and then facing up to this guard or assigning 2 to x and assigning up to this guard and then by the property uh, then, then you apply assignment you've got um, one equals two guards one, or two equals two guards two. The one equals two guards one turns into a false guards one, so that's null. That side doesn't make any contribution. That's the use of nothing, because there isn't a contribution on that side. And the two is the result you get. That's the, the, where the, the guard was satisfied and you got, you got through, you didn't get sent back. You can use the same, same semantics to represent if, because if you think of an if, the the, um, the branch that runs gives you the answer. The other branch gives you nothing. So our answers are in terms of expressions. And nothing is essential to you know, not have a contribution from the branch of the if that, that doesn't run. So we have a, a fourth structure to represent um, speculative computation. The brackets are run and run, and you run S, and it gives you the value of E, but then it runs backwards. So you, you get the value E would take if you were to run S, but without any changes. So it greatly reduces the number of side effects. You can sort of probe ahead and say, well, what would happen? What would happen if I did this chess move, and then he did that move, and then I did this move, and she did that move? And you get an answer, but nothing has changed. No variables have changed. No state has changed. And it, it's got, again, a simple rule. Uh, run S E diamond S is S. Uh, S is the stack. So here, S maps, S maps to S minor. You're just adding one item to the stack. And that item is S diamond E, as the previous semantics has described. You can also collect all the possible answers in a set. So this is uh, set notation. Um, this is a contribution of my co-author, Frank Zyder. Um, it's all, all, all the ways you can, you, it's like a tree traversal. You explore all the, all the ways you could get to finish running S and then evaluate E. You collect the set of all those values. Uh, And again, we have a fairly simple semantic rule. So this is where my paper gets even more pretentious. So this is a, I've got a taste for pretension. A pretension is rather a negative word in English, but this is purely due to the, the politics of um, royal succession, as you may well know, because we had the young pretender and so on. You know, we got rid of one lot of kings and kept another lot. And the ones we didn't want were called pretenders. And so pretension got a bad name. But pretension is a wonderful thing. You know, it means ambition and brain explosion. So this, this is a new concept of function application, given to us by, because we have the, this idea of nothing. And I, I'm going to introduce it with the idea of square roots. But... Uh, Oh, 
we had a choice uh, function before, and there's another kind of choice, which is choice from a set. So one four dot dot is, it gives you the set one, two, three, four. And uh, dot set will print it. And the word choice by itself just takes a choice from a set, it's provisional. If you backtrack, you get a different choice. So here's, here's an example of those structures. Um, this is a set of integers. You need that type declaration there. And um, it, it constructs this set, takes choices from it, multiplies each choice by 10, and it does that in all the possible ways, and you get this set 10, 20, 30, 40. So a little program to generate Pythagorean. Pythagorean triples, and it's going to use a perfect square root function. So we're working in integers. We're not interested in, in any approximation to a square root. Either a number has a square root or it doesn't. So this is a little demonstration of perf, perfect square root function. Zero has got a square root, which is zero. One's got a square root, which is one. Two doesn't have an integer square root. So that generates backtracking. In mathematically, uh, the square root of two is null. It doesn't have a square root, there's nothing. Like one over zero is null. The king of France is null. The king of France was um, Bertram Russell's conundrum in 1905. Uh, so this is just a programming tri trick from one point of view. We just put the guard inside the square root function to trigger backtracking if there isn't a square root. But mathematically, it is a new idea because in ordinary mathematics, you can't have null as a result of a function application. In this theory, you can. So that's why it's a new concept of function application at the mathematical level. So here's a program for a set of Pythagorean triples. This is a set of sets now because every Pythagorean triple, three, four, five, is going to be a set. So it's going to produce a set of Pythagorean triples with, with perpendicular sides less than n. So you, you get the, the um, sides between 1 and n, a set of them, and you take a choice. That's a, one of your sides. And then you get a bigger side by taking a, n, dot, dot. So that's the, 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 the rest of the numbers less than n. Um, and you put that in b. So you've got a and b. And A is the small one, B is the large one. Then you, you see if they're co-prime, because if you've got 3, 4, 5, you don't want 6, 8, 10 as well. Um, so co-prime is just going to, if, if, if they've got a common divisor, that'll just force backtracking. And, and then you work out eight, A squared times B squared. Ask if it's got a perfect square root. If it don't, it doesn't, you're forced to backtrack. If it has, you assign it to C, and then you um, form the set. This is how we write a, a set in, in, in postfix. Um, a comma B, so C comma. So uh, whereas in classical mathematics, the comma is infix, here our comma is postfix because it's actually adding a value to the set. And here's, uh, here, here's a run of triples. I'm just comes like that. So uh, I, I don't want to say any more because the, but there's a little bit more about the, there's another very important idea, which is when is it safe to use uh, an operation? Very complicated in force. When can you use plus? So it depends what you mean by plus. There isn't any answer really in force to say, is it safe for me to use plus? It will differ whether you're using signed, unsigned, and there are, there are more possibilities. You, some, in some applications, it's perfectly fine to wrap around if it's this kind of clock you're describing. So these, these all have their own sort of preconditions, but the, the, the theory uh, includes preconditions. They're a very important part, but they're, they're not part of the operation. They're part of when, when is it safe to use it. So that, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.
Yes. 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 Yeah, when I organized, the only time I ever organized a fourth conference, it was at Dagstall. And uh, he, he supplied a paper for the uh, proceedings, although um, he didn't actually come. But we had a paper in the proceedings about joy. Yes, that, that's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I've got a dying implementation because it's written in 32 bits. Um, well, GC, the latest, my latest installation of Ubuntu won't compile my system. It's a bit, bits of it are written in, in GeForce. And a lot of it's written in GC, GCC Assembler. No, no, it's not written in GeForce. It's written in GCC. And GC, the rest of it's in GCC Assembler, the, 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 the primitives. Um, but I have to, now I have to recompile it, I have to use a system which still runs GCC7. <laughs> Thank you.